this is Roger Green, host of the Surfing the Mesh Tsunami podcast. This week, we're offering five conversations from episode three, our discussion on the new nozzle nomenclature. Plus, from the vault, a discussion from Easel 2023 about the nomenclature presentation, which was originally presented formally there. Louise Campbell starts this conversation by discussing opportunities to create patient awareness in the NHS program in the UK to bring VCTE screening to primary care centers throughout the country. She notes Southampton as being an early success story for this program. She also notes that for the patient, the discussion still is likely to center around the idea of excess fat in the liver rather than steatosis per se. Mina Bonsal describes the impact of these conversations in different terms. For years, she notes, doctors would write hepatic steatosis on a chart, but would then describe to the patient as, quoting, just a little fat on the liver. The formalization of the disease as part of a broader medical process takes the word just out of that sentence. It makes the idea of treatment more pivotal and more formalized. Mina goes on to mention her excitement that she can add patients with higher levels of alcohol consumption into Mount Sinai's longitudinal registry now that they are defined as part of the same metabolic community to admit ALD. The discussion goes on to focus on the ability to include the liver in an overall metabolic perspective, as Jeff Lazarus mentions in the Healthy Liver and Healthy Lives Initiative. The nomenclature process was a multi-year activity with hundreds of participants and the potential to have a huge, really a huge footprint on this disease. This episode looks at how we've gotten here and what drove some of the key players in the activity. It contains an interesting piece of history, so just sit back, listen, learn, enjoy, and when you're done, join the dialogue in our LinkedIn discussion group. Louise Campbell. And I think testimony to that is it's like a funnel. The average person in the street with this condition Googles fatty liver. They're not Googling a definition and a scientific name and we drill it down. So as they come into primary care, I think we're going to have an opportunity in the UK with Fibroscan being rolled out to primary care. And depending on how that uptake is and who is doing those Fibroscans, there is that discussion to bring in the full definition very early to primary primary care if it is the correct people scanning, which are nurse specialists within the field. That is the education of the primary care into liver care. And it's worked very well in Southampton where they've put specialist fibre scan teams in. Primary care become way more aware of liver disease per se, and particularly this new meta-ALD definition. When I'm able to use that in the alcohol screening clinics to say, have you considered having a discussion around this? The patients are very, very receptive to that. It explains it a little bit easier and the physicians are more open to considering that. So there are lots of benefits, but the real world person that we see who's not been diagnosed still considers it as fatty liver. And they like that simple term, it's just excess fat in the liver, try not to stigmatize it. At that stage, it works very well to drill down. Maru Ranella. Because you know what? I think that part of that is that for a couple of decades, they've been told, oh, you just have fatty liver. It was actually downgraded as a disease because they had an ultrasound 20 years ago. And if you look at the ultrasound report, it doesn't say fatty liver. It says hepatic steatosis. It's steatotic liver disease. It's been that over decades. But when we translate it to patients and they, we say, oh, you, and that's the word just is really the, the kicker here, right? is that they've said, why, why am I, I just have fatty liver. So I think what we've done now is it's a clear disease with risk factors and prognostic implications. So I think that this is another way in which we have to get away from just. Roger Green. I mean, I think that's a really interesting point, And that's got two reframes in it, right? One is just. And the second is, does it matter really whether you describe this to a patient as steatotic liver or having fat in your liver, as long as you take the just out of it so the patient gets it. Well, not only that, what happens in an office between a, a doctor and a patient and how that patient then tells their family members what their disease is, is two different things. So as physicians, we always use certain terms to try to make technical terms understandable. So you don't say osteoporosis, you say thin bones. When you're explaining it to your patient, you're translating that medical term into something that they can understand. But the difference here now is why do you have the fat? in your liver? Why do you have the fat in the liver? Because you have underlying metabolic dysfunction, as opposed to it's not your fault, you just eat too much. You know, it's not that. There's metabolic dysfunction as a driver. So I explain that to people that you have, you can use the word fat, but when they have to go then tell their family members what they have, I have metabolic dysfunction and that's causing fat to deposit 
in my liver. And in me, that's causing some inflammation and scarring. So I need to take this very seriously. Yeah, that's great. That, that's fantastic, I think. So we now have met ALD. How does that roll out to doctors and to patients right now? How, how is that working? I assume people are getting it, but what are they doing with it? And I think that's where the research, where, where it's so exciting, because now we can actually characterize those patients. So for example, at Mount Sinai, we have our MASH longitudinal registry. And Previously, you know, we had audit C and excluded patients with moderate alcohol consumption. We've now opened up our registry to allow increased amounts of alcohol consumption so that we can start to study this population more clearly. So I think this is where it's more enrolling these patients in clinical trials as they evolve, enrolling these patients in longitudinal uh, studies to understand their natural history because we really haven't studied it. Okay. Thoughts? Mina Bonsall. I, I also say that there's a lot of excitement in the pharma industry as well over this particular disease, this entity of MET-ALD. And there are studies being developed for that particular population of patients that were not being addressed before. So that's really cool. And as it turns out, there are a couple of drugs that are in the pipeline mechanisms that really actually make sense for that overlap condition um, where you can you know, impact cravings and things of that nature and in others where you can actually actually preferentially reduce the impetus for scar tissue formation and things like that. So there's a lot of excitement over it, you know, for good reason. So Louis, you're the other obvious head nodder. What nodding your head about? I totally agreed with Mina on that, dropping the just and that conversation. Where that took me was to Jeff's healthy liver, healthy lives. Because when we talk about disease, and I was having a conversation with somebody who was doing pathology yesterday, they only look at the end of state, the later stages. We've had an unhealthy liver for an awful long time to get disease in most disease states. So writing back the liver into the story way earlier in primary care and all of those areas, this now opens those opportunities to keep your liver healthy. It helps your life. It's the conductor of your body symphony. And people that I engage with who aren't there because they're here from by a medical route really engage with understanding the role of the liver, the regenerative capacity, Mother Nature's first organ because it's the only one. So bringing it back to how it affects their life, just generally that conversation, they engage in that very well. The opportunity to research MET-ALD, particularly in cardiovascular areas, where alcohol is probably just as unrecognized in that development, now opens all of those opportunities. Because I see an awful lot of, as we all do, people who have cardiac or atrial fibrillation who just have those areas of steatotic points. So I agree with it all. So I'm going to carry I'm nodding because it's been a fantastic process and difficult at times. I know. Go ahead, Mina. On this met ALD, I think the fascinating part, and this was actually a comment that resonated me with a patient advocate. Jen Jones made this comment in a in, in an email. Right now, we're talking about okay, those who have metabolic dysfunction and have moderate alcohol drinking. Take it from the other side. Those who actually you're treating more for their alcohol associated liver disease, but they have metabolic dysfunction, right? So you have to look at how are they entering the system? They're entering from both sides. So she, we shouldn't just be thinking about those who are entering from the metabolic dysfunction side, but those who are also entering from, they've been more honest perhaps. <laughs> and, and so we're looking at them just quit your, but we're ignoring their metabolic dysfunction. Interesting. I, I think it just tightens awareness for the complexity of caring for a whole human being, right? So you have to just not be so you know blinded into managing just your particular niche. It really is. You need to look at patients more broadly and address their issues holistically. And that includes all of these things that we're talking about. So, but Marie, that's now two dimensions on which we're talking about being more holistic. One is the idea that because we're talking about a metabolic condition, we're not only in the liver anymore, but the liver is part of the, a broader system of multiple organs and multiple diseases. And then within the patient, looking more multidimensionally at what it is that might get the patient to where they are right now. So i would not thought of this description as being the equivalent of three dimensional chess, but you can, you can kind of get there from here if you play it that way. Mike Patel. The approach to every patient, as Maru said, is it has to be tailored because it depends on what is the most, probably what's the most critical issue with that patient at that time. So they may be dealing with an endocrinologist first, as an example. And I have heard at some of the conferences we've gone to, it depends which door in the hospital they go into. And now back to Roger. 
We hope you've enjoyed this recording. If you have any questions or comments about the content in this conversation or the entire episode, please put them in the review section of the page from which you downloaded this conversation or send an email to questions at surfingnash.com. We'll be back next week to discuss what we know about mazel epidemiology today. Until then, stay safe, surf on. We'll see you next week on the podcast. Bye now.